Peter Ten Hope, a Dutch photographer, moved to Sweden a long time ago. He's been, I thought that was really funny, Swedish Photographer of the Year, three times in a row, you can be that there, and he's got his own Wikipedia page in Swedish. Um, he's made beautiful, beautiful projects as a photographer, and is also working on a video, visiting communities, and you know, showing the world what happens there. Peter, tell us all about your work. Thank you very much. Hello. <clears throat> well, the thing is, wait, let me take a comfortable position here. Once I have the stage, thank you all, speakers who were in front of me. I didn't understand everything, to be honest. It was really interesting. But I have to say, we don't always need you anymore. <laughs> Sorry. We're in control soon. Yes, 16 years Stockholm. Uh, I can't recommend it. The thing that happens is that when you come back, you start speaking Dutch. You sound like you had a very bad LSD trip. Uh, you lose your hair, apparently. Maybe that's not the Stockholm problem. No, I will, I'm not brought here to speak, actually, they told me. I'm here to show what I've been doing. But it's correct, living in Stockholm, I'm educated in forestry, it all makes sense. Uh, the thing is that uh, I was not that suited for forestry, so I decided to study photojournalism, and this I did in Sweden. Scandinavia, Scandinavia has a strong and long history of good photojournalistic schools, and I was very happy that I was actually selected for one. I don't know how that happened, but it, it did happen. Uh, I've been working through the years for, yeah, most international media. I'm a freelance and I'm connected to VU in France. Uh, the reason why I'm here actually tonight is because of a film I did. Well, a short documentary, 45 minutes. And of a book I've made, this one. We still make books. The film is in the book. The thing is that I started working on this project, it must be in 2003. It was just before the elections where George W. Bush was re-elected for the second time. And the reason I went to the USA was because of a book I've got from my mother uh, when I was 13 years old, which was called Travels with Charlie. And Travels with Charlie is this little beautiful pocket written by John Steinbeck. And John Steinbeck wrote this book in the end of his career when he realized that he basically didn't have any contact anymore with the country where he was from. He had a fantastic career, but he had lost contact with the country, USA. So he decided to travel around with a camper, and he brought along his little dog, Charlie. Traveled with Charlie. So he travels through the whole US and writes this beautiful little, I would almost say journalistic book, uh, about the whole trip. And the thing is that he never writes about Montana. He writes about most of the states in the USA, but not about Montana. So uh, the only thing he says in, uh, in the book about Montana is this. The next passage in the book is a love affair. I'm in love with Montana. For other states, I have admiration and even some affection. But with Montana, it's love. And from there he leaves us. He doesn't say anything about Montana. So, in that time, we all know what happened. The planes were flying, had been flying in the World Trade Center. I was in the US working with that in that time. And, and the country was basically, it was chaotic. And I was very curious in the identity of the US at that moment, basically. So I sold this story, based in that time, to a magazine, and went to Montana, and I thought I'm gonna make this story about Montana to figure out what is the US? And I wanted to do it in Montana because of this reason. Well, you know, we photographers or filmers, it doesn't really work like that. So you go to Montana, it's about the same size as Sweden, and you're going to make a story. It's not that easy. I like in my photography in general, so I like to dig where I stand. Keep it simple. So after one week working in Montana, I realized I can't tell this story. So the thing I did was I decided one evening the next town I'm driving through the next morning, I'm going to stay for at least 10 days to 
tell the story. So start driving next morning, the first town I hit in a little valley, Hungry Horse, Montana. Perfect. It's a great title, situated in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. You can't lose. Well, the thing that happens is that I stayed for more than 10 years. Uh, this took 12 years. Uh, as far as it comes to slow food in photography and in documentary, this is it. So it started out, let's see if I can get this right. It started out with photography, of course. In that time, there was no multimedia. It had started a little bit. Uh, media Storm had started a little bit. You, all, you, you know the company called Media Storm in the US? No? Multimedia basically started there, I would say, at least for a bigger crowd, which is a good thing. But I spent, I don't know, I made 17 trips, I think, to Hungry Horse, basically knocking doors and, uh, well, inviting myself into people's homes, get chased by shotguns or whatever. But after a couple of years, I realized that, at least four or five years, that it's extremely hard after such a long time to continue reinventing yourself, basically, photography-wise, language-wise. So the thing, I needed a new way of telling stories. Brian Storm from Media Storm already had asked me for, for three years in a row that he really wanted to produce a multimedia story on this, on Hungry Horse. I was all the whole time not interested because of the fact that I thought multimedia is extremely boring. Uh, you know how it looked, the first multimedia stories, you have a cup of coffee, you know, you have first you have a film sequence, then someone takes a cup of coffee, second picture, third picture, then he drinks a cup of coffee. What the fuck should I do with that? It doesn't work for me. And I've never been a fan of still images in multimedia, to be honest. For me, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Start filming and make a separate body of work in good photography, where you concentrate on the photographic language, where you concentrate on storytelling. Slivo, just released from the, I've been doing crystal meth, cooking crystal meth, 15 years of prison. So I spent that 10 years, but it was only in the end I started filming. Brian uh, finally convinced, convinced me to start filming. And I did it not because of the fact that multimedia was a cool thing or a very high thing in that time. I did it because of the fact that I realized that photography is fucking arrogant. Come on. We always think that we tell so much with our pictures and this and that. I don't think so, you know? It's just my vision, it's just my little story. And I'm kind of bored of that many times as well. I like to question myself in that process. So, how can you question yourself in that process? Well, start interviewing people on film and start working with people in a different way. Because in the end, it's me who is editing. It's me who puts it all together, you know? And like they say, photography is the truth. Yeah, well, maybe my truth, but not in a bigger, broader sense. The thing, one of the other reasons was I wanted to do this is that I wanted the body of work to be complete. So that means a great text, a film, a documentary, and the stills. I want to be complete, just to finish it. I will show you now the first, the, basically the start of the, of the documentary. There's no interview there. And after that, I will show you an interview with Katie, one of the char characters in the, in the book. Uh, you saw the girl laying on the bed? That's Katie. Fantastic. So we start with, can we bring the lights down? Thank you. So we start with the, basically a more, how do we call it? More philosophical way of seeing Hungry Horse.
when we hear, we will fasten ourselves to it and we will not let go because it is your word and it is taking us to what you have promised if we don't lose, lose heart and faint and give up. Thank you. It's great coffee. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So, the movie. <laughs> Thank you. Don't leave yet. One more film to go. <laughs> Just kidding. One little uh, part I want to show, Katie. Like I said, uh, the movie is uh, based on three interviews with three characters from the book. Uh, Katie had a hard ride. Uh, when I met her, she was just had become clean, using basically everything she could use. A little child. Uh, then, like I said, she became clean, and I've seen her through the years just grow as a human being. Today, she runs marathons. She climbs mountains 7,000 meters high. Incredible to see that ride. So working with long-term projects in that way have its advantages. Uh, but let's take a look at Katie. That's the last thing I'm going to show you. And thank you for, well, listening and watching this. Let's take a look two times. I remember when my father introduced the idea of us moving to Montana. He came home and asked me and my sister what we thought about moving out west. Being a teenager at that time and very rebellious, I didn't like the idea very much. On the other hand, it was probably the best thing that happened. I had no idea where anything was, who anybody was. I felt a little lost at the time. It was a tough time for me when I moved here. I was very resentful towards my father. I had no friends, I had nobody. I felt very alone. The first people that I met, I so much wanted to be a part of a group. That was my first introduction to methamphetamine. Um, I would sneak out of the house at night to meet these people and participate in drinking or smoking weed or um, just driving around. Um. I like excitement, fast moving, fast paced. When I was coming down, just feeling drained, not as energetic, not as going, where I thought, oh, if I just have a little bump or a little bit more, I can continue on, can keep going. Um, I didn't want to miss out on anything. Yeah, there were some nights I remember I didn't want to go to bed because I thought I would miss out on something with my friends or in the world. Next thing I know, um, yeah, I was pregnant. I had my son in June, and 
at that time, that's when I was using meth a little bit more. I realized that it gave me, I mean, some of the uh, good sides of meth where it gave you energy, you were able to accomplish a lot more. Keep up with the house chores, being um, a young mom with the responsibilities of working two, three jobs and raising a baby and doing the housework, all those things. I didn't feel that I could physically do that on my own. In a way, meth helped me achieve those things. I was compromising my son's time by staying out late with my friends, um, leaving my son home with his father, not coming home until later, sometimes not at all. And it was at that time that I chose, I, I pretty much chose meth over my family. And that's when I continued the quick spiral uh, to my bottom. I was thrown in jail for about a couple weeks. I was released into my father's custody under the idea that I was to go to treatment. For the first time, I listened to other people that had similar experiences. Maybe not just with meth, but internally, feelings, emotions. I had those same experiences or feelings and I didn't think anybody else did and I felt very alone. My son was a big factor in me uh, staying sober. I quit for him until I realized how that I was able to quit for myself. My love for him and for myself now is what keeps me clean. Um, I haven't used meth since, and that was 15 years ago, which is pretty awesome. I had to remove myself from everyone and anything that had to do with meth and any of that scene. It wasn't a pretty road, it wasn't a pretty journey, and I wouldn't make the same choices, but I'm very grateful for those experiences. My son is 16, he'll be 17 in June. It was at that time that I started experimenting with meth. And I, it scares me, uh, especially in this area. Uh, meth is, is a big, problem. Something I think about pretty often. So I guess it's funny looking back like when you're little and wondering where you'll be when you grow up. Here I am, I'll be 35 in September and I would have never imagined that this is where I would be. I love it here in Montana. I love this place. It gives me a sense of fullness internally. It's very magical here. It's very... <clears throat> I don't mean to get emotional, but I think of all the things that I've encountered here in Montana, and um, it's sometimes undescribable. It strikes a chord. This is home for me. I don't know if I'd be able to find this anywhere else.